Hello and welcome back to Classic Books of Ostara in my companion Lil. And I'd like to apologize for not having been on for the last several days as I have uh I'm gonna have bouts with pneumonia and it was it's from C O P D. It's been a scary time, especially with this virus going on, especially for people with C O P D and asthma and it's just I've been very sick with and they ne nearly admitted me, which I didn't allow. I'm still not feeling the best, but, you know, just trying to take this all one day at a time. But, um, so tonight, I uh, <laughs> try to get my mind off things. It's really kind of pressed, understandably. I am going to read, start reading Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. And... Without further ado, see here. <coughs> Getting into the hot coffee. <laughs> this from COPD. <clears throat> and part one. <coughs> when he was nearly 13, my brother Jem got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed and Jem's fears of never being able to play football was was assaged, he was seldom self-conscious about his injury. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right when he stood or walked. The back of his hand was at right angles to his body. His thumb paralleled to his thigh. He couldn't have cared less so long as he could pass and punt. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintain that the Ewell started it all, but Jem, who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill came to us when Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Bradley come out. I said if he wanted to make take a broad view of the thing, it really began with Andrew Jackson. If General Jackson had run the creeks up the creek, creek Simon Finch would never have paddled up the Alabama. And where would we be if he hadn't? We were far too old to settle on an ar argument with a fist bite, so we consulted Atticus. Our father said we were both right. <clears throat> Being Southerners, it was a source of shame to some members of the family that we had no recorded ancestors on either side of the Battle of Hastings. Oh, he, we had with Simon Finch, a fur-trapping apothecary from Cornwall whose piety was exceeded only by his stinginess. In England, Simon was irritated by the persecution of those who called themselves Methodists at the hands of their more liberal brethren, and as Sam Simon called himself a Methodist, he worked his way across the Atlantic to Philadelphia, thus thence to Jamaica, thence to Mobile, and up the St. Stephen's, mindful of John Wesley Wesley's strict strictures on the use of many words in buying and selling, Simon made a pile of practicing medicine. But in this pursuit he was unhappy lest he be tempted into doing what he knew was not for the glory of God as the putting on of gold and costly apparel so Simon having forgotten his teacher's dictum on the possession of human chattels bought three slaves and with their aid established a homestead on the banks of the Alabama River some 40 miles above St. Stephen's he returned to St. Stephen's only once to find a wife and with, their estab and with her established a line that ran high to daughters, Simon lived to an impressive age and died ri rich. Let's see. It was customary for the men in the family to remain on Simon's homestead, Finch's landing, and make their living from cotton. The place was self-sufficient, modest in comparison with the empires around it. The landing nevertheless produced everything required to sustain life except ice. Wheat flour and articles of clothing supplied by river boats from Mobile. Simon would have regarded with impotent fury the disturbance between the North and the South as it left his descendants stripped of everything but their land. Yet the tradition of living on the land remained unbroken until well into the 20th century when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law, law and his younger brother went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister, Alexandra, was the Finch who remained at the landing. She married a taciturn man who spent most of his time lying in a hammock by the river, wondering if his trot lines were full. 
I mean, my fa father was, when my father was admitted to the bar, returned to Maycomb, <clears throat> began his practice. Maycomb, some 20 miles, some 20 miles east of Pinchers Landing, was the county seat of Maycomb County. Atticus's office in the courthouse contained a little more than a hat rack, a spittoon, a checkerboard, and an unsullied coat of Alabama. His first two clients were the last two persons hanged in the Maycomb County Jail. Atticus had urged them to accept the state's generosity in allowing them to plead guilty to second-degree murder and escape with their lives, but they were Haverfords in Maycomb County, a name synonymous with jackass. The Haverfords had dispatched Maycomb's leading blacksmith in a misunderstanding rising from their, the alleged wrongful detention of a mayor were imprudent enough to do it in the presence of three witnesses and insisted that the son of a bitch had it coming to him was a good enough defense for anybody. They persisted in pleading not guilty to first-degree murder, so there was nothing much Atticus could do for his clients except be present at their departure, occasion that was probably the beginning of my father's profound distaste for the practice of criminal law. During his first five years in Maycomb, Atticus practiced economy more than anything. For several years thereafter, he invested his earnings in his brother's education. John Hale Finch was ten years younger than my father and chose to study medicine at a time when cotton was not worth growing. But after getting Uncle Jack started, Atticus derived a reasonable income from the law. He liked to make him. He was Maycomb County, born and bred. He knew his people. They knew him, and because of Simon Finch's industry, Atticus was related by blood or marriage to nearly every family in the town. Maycomb was an old town, but it was a tired old town. When I first knew it, in rainy weather, the streets turned its red slop. Grass grew on the sidewalks. The courthouse sagged in the square. Somehow it was hotter than a black dog suffered on his summer's day. Bony mules hitched to Hoover's carts flicked flies in the sweltering shade of the live oaks on the square. Men stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon after three o'clock. Naps by nightfall were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. People moved slowly then. They ambled across the square, shuffled in and out of the stores around it, took their time about everything. A day was 24 hours long but seemed longer. There was no hurry, for there was nowhere to go. Nothing to buy and no money to buy it with. Nothing to see outside the boundaries of Maycomb County. But it was a time of vague optimism for some of the people. Maycomb County had recently been told that it had nothing to fear but fear itself. We lived on the main residential street in town. Atticus Gemini plus Cal Calpurnia or Cook. Gemini found our father satisfactory. He played with us, read to us, and treated us with courteous detachment. Calpurnia was something else again. She was all angles and bones. She was nearsighted. She squinted. Her hand was hand was wide as a bed slat and twice as hard. She was always ordering me out of the kitchen, asking me why I couldn't behave as well as Jem when she knew he was older, calling me home when I was, wasn't ready to come. Our battles were epic and one-sided. Calpurnia always won, mainly because adequate Kiss always took her side. She had been with us ever since Jem was born, and I had left her tyrannical presence as long, and I had felt her tyrannical presence as long as I could remember. My mother died when I was two, so I never felt her absence. She was a Graham from Montgomery. Atticus met her when he was first elected to the state legislator. He was middle-aged then. She was fifteen years as a junior. Jem was the product of their first year of marriage. Four years later, I was born, and two years later, our mother died from a sudden heart attack. They said it ran in her family. I did not miss her, but I think Jem did. He remembered her clearly, and sometimes in the middle of a game, he would sigh at length and go off and play by himself behind the car house. When he was like that, I knew better than to bother him. When I was almost six and Jem was nearly ten, I was some time boundaries within calling distance of Calpurnia, where Mrs. Henry Lafayette's Dubose's, Dubose's house, two doors to the north of us, and the Radley place, three doors to the south. We were never tempted to break them. The Radley place was inhabited by an unknown entity, the mere description of whom was enough to make us behave for days on end. Mrs. Dubose was plain hell. That was the summer Dill came to us. 
Early one morning, as we were beginning our day's play in the backyard, Jem and I heard something next door in Miss Rachel Haverford's collar patch. We went to the wire fence to see if there was a puppy. Miss Rachel's rat terrier was expecting. Instead, we found someone sitting looking at us. Sitting down, he wasn't much higher than the colliards. We stared at him until he spoke. Hey, hey yourself, said Jem pleasantly. I'm Charles Baker Harris, he said. I can read. So what, I said. I just thought you'd like to know I can read. You got anything needs reading? I can do it. How old are you, asked Jem. Four and a half. Going on seven? Shoot, no wonder then, said Jem, jerking his thumb at me. Scouts? Scout yonder's been reading ever since she was born. And she ain't even started the school started the school yet. You look right puny for going on seven. I'm little, but I'm old, he said. Jem brushed his hair back to get a better look. Why don't you come over, Charles Baker Harris, he said. Lord, what a name. Not any funnier than yours. Aunt Rachel says your name's Jeremy Atticus Finch. Jem scowled. I'm big enough to fit mine, he said. Your name's longer than you are. Bet it's a foot longer. Folks call me Dill, said Dill, struggling under the fence. Do better if you go over it instead of under it, I said. Where'd you come from? Dill was from Meridian, Mississippi. He was, was spending the summer with his aunt, Miss Rachel, and would be spending every summer in Maycomb from now on. His family was from Maycomb County originally. His mother worked for a photographer, and Meridian had entered his picture in a beautiful child's contest and won five dollars. She gave the money to Dill, who went to the picture show 20 times on it. Don't have any pictures, picture shows here, except Jesus ones in the courthouse sometimes, said Jim. Ever see anything good? Dill had seen Dracula, a revelation that moved Jim to eye him with the beginning of respect. Tell it to us, he said. Dill was a curiosity. He wore blue linen shorts that buttoned it to his shirt. His hair was snow white and struck and stuck to his head like duck fluff. He was a year my senior, but I towered over him. As he told us the old tale in his blue eyes, his blue eyes would lighten and darken. His laugh was sudden and happy. He habitually pulled a, a cowlick in the center of his forehead. When Dill reduced Dracula to dust and Jim said the show sounded better than the book, I asked Dill where his father was. You ain't said nothing, anything about him. I haven't got one. Is he dead? No. Then if he's not dead, you've got one, haven't you? Dill blushed and Jim told me to hush. A sure sign that Dill had been studied and found acceptable. Thereafter, the summer passed in routine contentment. Routine contentment was improving our treehouse that rested between two chi chi uh, twin china berry trees in the backyard. Fussing running through our li over our list of dramas based on the works of Oliver Optic, Victor Appleton, and Edgar Rice Burroughs. In this matter, we were lucky to have Dill. He played the character parts formally thrust upon me. The ape in Tarzan, Mr. Crab, Tree and the Rover Boys, Mr. Damon and Tom Swift. Thus we came to know Dill as a pocket Merlin whose head teemed with eccentric plans, strange longings, and quaint fancies. But by the end of August, our repertoire was va vapid from countless reproductions. And it was then that Dill gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. The Radley place fascinated Dill, in spite of our warnings and explanations that drew him as the moon draws water, but drew him no nearer than the light pole on the corner, a safe distance from the Radley gate. There he would stand, his arm around the fat pole, staring and wondering. The Radley place jutted into a sharp curve beyond our house. Walking south, one faced its porch. The sidewalk turned and ran beside the lot. The house was low, was once white with a deep front porch and green shutters, but had long ago darkened to the color of the slate gray yard around it. Rain rotted shingles drooped over the eaves of the veranda. Oak trees kept the sun away. The remains of a picket drunkenly guarded the front yard, a swept yard that was never swept, where Johnson grass and rabbit tobacco grew in abundance. Inside the house lived a malevolent phantom. People said he existed, but Jem and I had never seen him. People said he went out at night when the moon was down and peeped in windows. And people's azaleas froze in a cold snap was because he had breathed on them. And he stealthy small crimes committed in Maycomb were his work. 
Once the town was terrorized by a series of morbid nocturnal events, people's chickens and household pets were found mutilated, although the culprit was Crazy Addie, who eventually drowned himself in, Barker, in Barker's Eddy. People still looked at the Radley place, unwilling to discard their initial suspicions. A Negro would not pass the Radley place at night. He would cut across to the sidewalk opposite and whistle as he walked. The Maycomb school grounds adjoined the back of the Radley lot. From the Radley chicken yard, tall pecan trees shook their fruit into the schoolyard. But the nuts, nuts lay untouched by the children. Radley pecans would kill you. A baseball hit into the Radley yard was a lost ball and no questions asked. The misery of that house began many years before Jim and I were born. The Radleys welcome anywhere in town kept to themselves, a pre predilection unforgivable in Maycomb. They did not go to church, Maycomb's principal re recreation, but worshipped at home. Mrs. Radley seldom, if ever, crossed the street for a mid-morning coffee break with her neighbors, and certainly never joined the missionary circle. Mr. Radley walked the town at 11.30 every morning and came back promptly at 12, sometimes carrying a brown paper bag that the neighborhood soon contained the family groceries. I never knew how old Mr. Radley made his living. Jim said he bought cotton. A polite term for doing nothing, but Mr. Radley and his wife had lived there with their two sons as long as anybody could remember. The, sh the sh shutters and doors of the Radley house were closed on Sundays. Another thing alien to Maycomb's ways. Closed doors meant illness and cold weather only. Of all days, Sunday was the day for formal afternoon visiting. Ladies were, wore corsets. Men wore coats. Children wore shoes, but to climb the Radley front steps and call hay of a Sunday afternoon as sometimes their neighbors never did. It was something their neighbors never did. The Radley house had no screen doors. I once asked Atticus if it ever had any. Atticus said yes, but before I was born. According to neighborhood legend, when the younger Radley boy was in his teens, he became acquainted with some of the Cunninghams from Old Sarum and an enormous and confusing tribe an enormous and confusing tribe domiciled in the nor northern part of the country. They formed the nearest thing to a gang ever seen in Maycomb. They did little but enough to be discussed by the town and publicly warned from three pulpits. They hung around the barber shop. They rode the bus to Abbotsville on Sundays. They went to the picture show. They attended dances at the county's Riverside Gambling Hell. The do drop in and fishing camp. They experimented with stump hole whiskey. Nobody in Maycomb had nerve to tell Mr. Radley that his boy was in with the wrong crowd. One night in an excessive spurt of high spirits, the boy backed around the corner square in a, in a borrowed fliver, resisted arrest by Maycomb's ancient beetle, Mr. Connor, and locked him in the courthouse outhouse. The town decided something had to be done. Mr. Connor said he knew who each and every one of them was and he was bound and determined they wouldn't get away with it. So the boys came before the probate judge on charges of disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, assault and battery, and using abusive and profane language in the presence and hearing of a female. The judge asked Mr. Connor why he included the last charge. Mr. Connor said that he, they cussed so loud he was sure every lady in Maycomb heard them. The judge, judge decided to send the boys to the state industrial school where boys were sometimes sent for no other reason than, reason than to provide them with food and decent shelter. It was no prison and it was no disgrace. Mr. Radley thought it was. If the judge released Arthur, Mr. Radley would see to it that Arthur gave no further trouble. Knowing that Mr. Radley's word was his bond, the judge was glad to do so. The other boys attended the industrial school and received the best secondary education he had in the state. One of them eventually worked his way through engineering school at Auburn. The doors of the Radley house were closed on weekends as well as Sundays, and Mr. Radley's boy was not seen again for 15 years. But there came a day, barely within Jem's memory, when Boo Radley was heard from and was seen by several people, but not by Jem. He said Atticus never talked much about the Radleys. When Jem would question him, Atticus's only answer was for him to mind his own business and let the Radleys mind theirs. 
They had a right to, but when it happened, Jem said, Atticus shook his head, said, mm-hmm. So Jem received most of his information from Miss Stephanie Crawford, a neighborhood scold, who said she knew the whole thing. According to Miss Stephanie, Boo was sitting in the living room cutting some items from the Makeham Tribune to paste in a scrapbook. His father entered the room. As Mr. Radley passed by, Boo, Boo drove the scissors into his parents' leg, pulled them out, wiped them on his pants, and resumed his activities. Mrs. Radley ran screaming into the street that Arthur was killing them all, but when the sheriff arrived, he found Boo still sitting in the living room, cutting up the Tribune. He was 30 years old then. Miss Stephanie said old Miss Radley said no Radley was going to any asylum when it was suggested that a season Tuscaloosa might be helpful to Boo. Boo wasn't crazy. He was high-strung at times. It was all right to shut him up, Mr. Radley conceded, but insisted that Boo was not, could not... Boo not be charged with anything. He was not a criminal. The sheriff hadn't the heart to put him in jail alongside Negroes. So Boo was locked in the courthouse basement. Boo's transition from the basement to back home was nebulous in Jem's memory. Miss Stephanie Crawford said some of the town council told Mr. Radley that if he didn't take Boo back, Boo would die of mold from the damp. Besides, Boo could not live forever in the on the bounty of the county. Nobody knew from, knew what form of intimidation Mr. Radley employed to keep Boo out of sight, but Jem figured that Mr. Radley kept him chained to the bed most of the time. Atticus said no, it wasn't that sort of thing, that there were other ways of making people into ghosts. My memory came alive to see Mr. Radley occasionally open the front door, walk to the edge of the porch, and pour water on our can canners. But every day, Jem and I would see Mr. Radley walking to and from town. He was a thin, leathery man with colorless eyes, so colorless they did not reflect light. His cheekbones were sharp, and his mouth was wide, with a thin upper lip and a full lower lip. Miss Stephanie Crawford said he was uptight, upright. He took the word of God as his only law, and we believed her because Mr. Radley's posture was ramrod straight. He never spoke to us when he, pa when he passed. We would look at the ground and say, Good morning, sir, and he would cough in reply. Mr. Radley's elder son lived in Pensacola. He came home at Christmas, and he was one of the few persons we ever saw enter or leave the place. From the day Mr. Radley took Arthur home, people said the house died. But there came a day when Atticus told us he'd wear us out if we made any noise in the yard and commissioned Calpurnia to serve in his absence if she heard a sound out of us. Mr. Radley was dying. He took his time about it. Wooden sawhorses blocked the road at each end of the Radley lot. Straw was put down on the sidewalk. Traffic was diverted to the back street. Dr. Reynolds parked his car in front of our house and walked to the Radleys. Every time he called Jen called Gemini crept around the yard for days. At last the saw horses were taken away. We stood watching from the front porch when Mr. Radley made his final journey past our house. There goes the meanest man ever God ever God blew breath into, murmured Calpurnia, and she spat meditatively into the yard. We looked at her in surprise, for Calpurnia really commented on the ways of white people. The neighborhood thought when Mr. Radley went under Boo would come out, but it had another think coming. Boo's elder brother returned from Pensacola and took Mr. Radley's place. The only difference between him and his father was their ages. Jem said Mr. Nathan Radley bought cotton, too. Mr. Nathan would speak to us, however, when we say good morning, and sometimes we saw him coming from town with a magazine in his hand. The more we told Dill about the Radleys, the more he wanted to know. The longer he would st stand hugging the light pole on the corner, the more he would wonder. Wonder what he does in there, he would murmur. Looks like he'd just stick his head out the door. Jem said he goes out all night when it's pitch dark. Miss Stephanie Crawford said she woke up in the middle of the night one time and saw him looking straight through the window at her. Said his head was like a skull looking at her. Ain't you ever waked up at night and heard him, Dill? He walks like this, Jem said his slid his feet through the gravel. Why do you think Miss Rachel locks up so tight at night? I seen his tracks in our backyard many a morning, and one night I heard him scratching on the back screen, but he was gone time Atticus got there. 
Wonder what he looks like, said Dill. Jem gave a reasonable description of Boo. Boo was about six and a half feet tall. Judging from his tracks, he dined on raw squirrels and any cats he could catch. That's why his hands were bloodstained. If you ate an animal raw, you could never wash the blood off. There was a long, jagged scar that ran across his face. What teeth he had were yellow and rotten. His eyes popped, and he drooled most of the time. Let's try to make him come out, said Dill. I'd like to see what he looks like. Jem said if Dill wanted to get himself killed, all he had to do was go up and knock on the front door. Our first raid came to pass only because Dill bet Jem the great ghost against two Tom Swifts that Jem wouldn't get any further than the Radley Gate. In all his life, Jem had never declined a dare. Jem thought about it for three days. I suppose he loved honor more than his head, for Dill wore him down easily. He was scared, Dill said the first day. Ain't scared, just respectful, Jem said. The day, next day, Jill said, you're too scared even to put your big toe in the front yard. Jem said he reckoned he wasn't. He'd pass the Bradley place every school day of his life. Always running, I said. But Dill got him the third day when he told Jem that folks in Meridian County weren't as afraid as the folks in Maycomb. That he'd never seen such scary folks as the ones in Maycomb. This was enough to make Jem march to the corner where he stepped and leaned against the light pole, watching the gate hanging crazily on the, on its homemade hinge. I hope you've got, got it through your head that he'll kill us each and every one, Dill Harris said Jem, when we joined him. Don't blame me when he gouges your eyes out. You started it, remember? You were still scared, murmured Dill patiently. Jem wanted Dill to know once and for all that he wasn't scared of anything. It's just that I can't think of a way to make him come out without him getting us. Besides, Jem had his little sister to think of. When he said that, I knew he was afraid. Jem had his little, had his little sister to think of all the time. I dared him to jump off the top of the house. If I got killed, what'd become of you, he asked. Then he jumped, landed on her, and a sense of responsibility left him and totally confronted by the rattly place. You gonna run out on a dare? asked Dill. If you are, then... Dill, you have to think about these things, Jem said. Let me think a minute. It's sort of like making a turtle come out. How's that, asked Dill. Strike a match under him. I told Jem if he sets fire to the Radley house, I was going to tell Atticus on him. Dill said striking a match under a turtle was hateful. Ain't hateful, just persuades him. It's not like you'd chunk him in the fire, Jem growled. How do you know a match don't hurt him? Turtles can't feel stupid, said Jem. <laughs> Were you ever a turtle, huh? My stars, Dill. Now let me think. Reckon we can rock him. Jem stood in, a thought, in thought so long that Dill made a mild concession. I won't say you ran out on a deer, and I'll swap you the gray ghost if you just go up and touch the house. Jem brightened. Touch the house, that all? Dill nodded. Sure, that's all, now. I don't want you hollering something different the minute I get back. Yeah, that's all, said Dill. He'll probably come out after you when he sees you in the yard. Then Scout'll, Scout and me will jump on him and hold him down till we can tell him we ain't going to hurt him. We left the corner, crossed the st side street that ran in front of the Radley house, and stopped at the gate. Well, go on, said Dill. Scout and me is right behind you. I'm going, said Jem. Don't hurry me. He walked to the corner of the lot, then back again, studying the simple terrain as if deciding how best to effect an entry frowning and scratching his head. Then I sneered at him. Jem threw the gate, opened the gate and sped to the side of the house, slapped it with his palm and ran past us. Not waiting to see if his foray was successful, Dill and I followed on his heels. Safely on our porch, panting and out of breath, we looked back. The old house was the same, droopy and sick, but as we stared down the street, we thought we saw an in, inside shutter move, flick, a tiny, almost invisible movement, and the house was still. And I'm going to stop there. It's the end of chapter one. But if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and comment below. And stay tuned for more from Kill a Mockingbird from Star Lil, and stay healthy.